<coughs> Shalom, Israel. Shalom, Shalom. <coughs> Brother Nakwam, watch me for Israel. Coming back at you with these precepts and another cold cut, giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. By Shema Mashiach, Kumalak Yavashai. Devil honor to thee like elders of the house of David. Yes, been in his truth for decades and decades, patiently waiting for the second coming of Hamashiach, like Kumalak Yavashai. The hearty, mighty Shalom to all of the men of the Lord who are out on the highways and byways, pushing his truth. The mighty men of the Lord, enduring all things for the elect's sake, magnifying the ministry, presenting their body as a living sacrifice, and again, enduring all things for the elect's sake. Shalom to those men. Shalom to all of the men that may not be out there on the highways and byways as of yet, but they're working on it. They're getting built up in the spirit. They're praying, they're fasting, they're studying. They're being diligent and abounding in the work of the Lord. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to all of the aqua thought that the sincere sisters out there holding it down in the households, reverencing the husbands, being submissive, being diligent, and moving in the spirit of our righteous foremothers. Shalom, shalom. Shabbat shalom to everybody tuning in live. Justin Washington from Egypt to Israel. They whom Yasha Allah, we got next Israel, hopeful elect 12 tribes, ancients new, why don't we? Eric Smith, Tab Max, the nilist atheist, right? You know? Nevertheless, we're going to get right into it, right? What really happened between Cain and Abel, right? That's the topic of this cold cut. What really happened between Cain and Abel? Touched on Genesis, the first chapter a while ago. Gen Genesis, the second chapter. We touched on what happened in the Garden of Eden between Adam and his wife. Now we're going to touch on what really happened in Genesis, the fourth chapter, right? Between Cain and Abel. And you can go out to, to any city and an average Joe. They know about Abel and Cain, or Cain and Abel, rather, right? You say, who's Cain, or Cain killed his brother, or who's Abel, so-and-so. So, you know, the average person, they've heard these names, and they're familiar with these names of Cain and Abel, but we're going to go deeper into it and show you what actually went down, hitting things in Genesis, right? So let's open it up. Let's go right into the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter, right? Let's go to Genesis chapter four and get right into it. Okay, so Lockie, let me pull this up. Okay, this is Genesis chapter 4 and 1, right? And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from Yahweh. Right now, this word knew, of course, it doesn't mean you get to know them in terms of what's your favorite this and that. Oh, do you like red or do you like blue? Do you like green or do you like it's not that kind of new? That new. Is laying down with having sex, if you can understand. So Adam laid down with his woman and she conceived, right? And bear Cain and said, I've gotten a man from Yahweh. So, you know, two things. Eve, first and foremost, she knew the name of Yahweh. And Cain, his name essentially means um, a weapon, right? A dagger, a weapon, a sword. That's what the word Cain actually means when you go into it. Now, they should have it in the Hebrew. Let's see. They say possession, right? It's not talking about a possession. They say smiths, right? But it also a smith is somebody that makes weapons. But ultimately, Cain's name goes back to a, a weapon maker or a weapon or a dagger, right? Eldest son of Adam and Eve and the first murderer having murdered his brother Abel. So they kind of jumped the gun on that definition, but let's go back into it. So she birthed Cain and said, I've gotten a man from Yahweh, right? And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So these men had two different lots. And Abel's lot resembles that of Israel. All throughout the Bible, you read about men of renown, prominent, famous men <clears throat> of our forefathers. They all spent their time as keepers of the sheep. Moses, he was a keeper of the sheep. David, he was a keeper of the sheep. You understand? A lot of our forefathers were keepers of the sheep, even on a literal level. Even Amos was a herd, uh, a gatherer of sycamore fruit and a herdsman from his youth. Elisha, he was plowing 12 oxen. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
And um, you'll see a lot of parallels when you read Genesis, the fourth chapter, when it comes to Cain and Abel and Esau and Jacob. You'll see the same spirit in Cain because Cain on a deeper level, which we will touch on if time permits, if the Lord permits, rather. We'll touch on Cain actually coming back on the earth as Esau. And we'll deal with Abel and Jacob. You know? So these are the two offices. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain wasn't given that lot. His job is to be a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought up the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. Now, what would compel Cain to bring an offering unto the Lord? Well, guess what? His father, his earthly father, Adam, is the one that taught him how to bring these offerings unto the Lord. Cain didn't just <clears throat> willfully wake up and say, hmm, I think I want to offer something to the Most High. No. And this isn't the first time. You know? When you go to Genesis, the third chapter, which we've covered, you see that the Most High actually instituted a way to reconcile man back to God through an atonement, through a particular sacrifice that had to be done. Right? Let's get that to Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. <clears throat> Right now, even the Hebrew is kawa, right? Which means breath or life, right? That's why her name means the mother of all living. Unto, unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And we've covered this in the previous uh, Genesis series, that this coat of skin is not literal, right? And for those who didn't tune in and, you know, you're kind of new in this thing or you need a refresher, that code of skin is speaking about the law of sacrifice, right? That's what the code of skin is talking about. Again, if you type in Adam and his wife, right? Let's coat, coat of skin. Esau has his images, which we pulled up. <clears throat> he has his artwork, you know, he has his lies. Is this what the Most High gave them? Did he hold out Adam and say, okay, do you dress to the right? Do you dress to the left? What's your arm size? And Adam had to hold his arm size out. And the Lord took that kind of tape measure out and said, I'll be still. And then, then Adam had to turn around and the Lord kind of got his leg, leg size. And he asked Eve, okay, do you wear a size zero? Okay, but I know you kind of, you know, you just did this. Do you want to wear a size two? Because if you wear a size, that, that didn't happen, man. There's no account of the Most High giving Adam and his wife measurements. And giving them an actual coat of skin. But leave it up to Esau. He will have you believe that they were literally walking around with a coat of skin. And that's what the Bible is not for everybody. Right? Remember the Most High said that he revealed it. Let's get that in Amos the third chapter. I may open up another blue letter. The Most High said that he revealed the secret unto his servants, the prophets. Right? Amos chapter 3 and 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets, not his servants, the Edomites, his servants, the Moabites, his servants, the prophets. They're the ones who were commissioned as ambassadors to bring the people back to the Most High. Therefore, they're the ones who have been given a particular level of knowledge of the holy text and the scriptures to be able to teach our people how to repent, how to serve the most high, what the secrets are, the in-depth breakdowns, the meetings, the dark sins, the parables, the milk, all of these things were given unto the prophets. Right? Let's go to the book of Proverbs, chapter three. So a lot of Genesis, the first four chapters are, are really embedded with secrets. Proverbs chapter three and verse. 32. For the forward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Here's that word secret again. So the Bible deals with secrets, which means everybody and their grandmother cannot be on the same level. You don't tell secrets to everybody, to anybody that just comes around. 
So why would the Mosai just tell secret? And that's mad. So why would Yahweh Bashim Yahweh just give all the secrets out to just any any old flesh and blood that presents himself to him? No, his secret is only with the righteous. It's not for everybody, man. Let's get that real quick. I'll get one more in that. Let's go to Song of Solomon, the fourth chapter. Right? Let's go to Song of Solomon, chapter four and uh, 12. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So a garden enclosed on a spiritual level is dealing with this, this word, this wisdom. See, you're married to wisdom. This is your spouse, your sister, your spouse. Even though, remember, Tobit called his wife, Anna, his sister. So I like, yeah. Hey, Shalom, King of Love. I'm hit you back. Okay, show on. Right? Even Tobit called his wife his sister and his spouse. Wisdom is a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So if you go to a fountain and it's sealed off, that means you don't have access to it. Like if you were in the world and they had these clubs and these different uh, 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 lounges, they had the VIP section. It was sealed off. A crime scene is sealed off. Right? If you go to a crime scene and they got that yellow tape, hey, only certain people can get in. CIA, the DEA, you know, these guys, the detectives, they're the only ones that can bypass that seal. But if you're just an average Joe from the public and you want to kind of see that body or see what happened, hey, they'll cut you off, say, hey, hold on, look, you can't do that. This is sealed off. Uh, um, I can't think of the exact terminology they use, but they say, I believe it's authorized personnel only, man. You know? And that's how this word is. The word, yeah, you can pick it up and you can read it and it's at your disposal. But the understanding of it and the secrets of it are sealed up. You know? And that's why a lot of people, when they read this account, they think that Abel just offered up vegetables eggplants, uh, damn corn, and, and squash, man, for no reason. You know? They don't know that this offering that Cain did was given to him in the previous chapter, the coats of skin. The coats of skin is the covering. Let's go to the book of, let's see, there's, there's a good amount of precepts. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Right, chapter nine. Let's get the class first and foremost. Right with the covering. Right, Ecclesiastes chapter nine and eight. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. So there's a garment. This, does this mean you always wear white, white tees, as if this is the year two thousand and three? White Easter Sunday outfits, as if you're in the world on Easter Sunday. No. When it says, let your garment be always white, it's speaking about your spirit, right? How you present yourself in his truth. You should be without spot and without blemish. You shouldn't be in a garment that's black, meaning defiled, with spots on it, stains on it, wrinkles. Your garment should be white, meaning pure, bright, radiant, spotless, you know? That's how a man's garment should be. Now, a garment covers you. A garment covers you from the nakedness. You understand? So our nakedness is a sin, but a garment covers our sin. So what covers up our sins during the time of old? Animal sacrifices. That was used as an atonement during the time of Moses and prior to the time of Moses for the sons of God to be reconciled back to him. Right, due to the sin of Adam. Right, let me let's get the book of Job, chapter 24. Right, let's go to Job, chapter 24. Job, chapter 24, and verse, let's start at seven, six. Job, chapter 24, and six. They heap every one his corn in the field. And they gather the vintage of the wicked. This is speaking about a so-called white man rape, robs, and murders. 
they, meaning the Edomites, cause the naked to lodge without clothing, that they have no covering in the cold. See that? So we're caused, really forced, to live a life with no covering. We're caused to lodge without clothing. What happens if you're in your house or you're outside and you have no covering? Clothes are used on a carnal level for what? To keep you warm. That's what. That's the purpose of them. Protection. So Esau spiritually takes away our clothing. He takes away our spirit of righteousness, our nationality, our heritage, the name of the Most High, laws, statutes, commandments. And that's why we don't have any covering in the cold, man. The cold being in this environment right here, this dark world that we live in. Because remember, when it's nighttime, the temperature drops, you know? And only certain beasts and creatures can see at night and survive in those elements. Even certain plants, they can't, they, they close up when, it's, uh, when the sun goes down. And when the sun comes up, they open up and they can deal with those elements. Not every beast and creation and element can operate in the cold. But Esau, he can operate in the cold. You see Edomites, even on a physical level, they got shorts on right now. Sandals. T-shirts. The cold is for them. You know? But we, you know, we don't deal with the cold. And I'm talking spiritually and I'm talking physically. More so spiritually. You have to kind of open up your mind when you get into this word. Right? Because you may say, well, I don't like the cold, too. I like the wintertime. I was, I'm a winter baby. It's not talking about you being a winter baby. Right? Let me go to the book of Revelation, the third chapter. Right? The cold is equated to a high level of darkness. Darkness is likened to sin and evil. Right? Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 18. Right, it reads, I counsel this Yahweh speaking. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. So these are the things you have to buy. What does it mean buy, acquire, gain? Right? You gain gold tried in the fire through works. You gain white raiment by repenting. And you go to the Most High, the Most High will give you a white raiment if you're keeping the law through faith. If you're diligent, right, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And that's what the Most High gave Adam and his wife. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now I want to go into this word in the Greek, eye salve, because that's what you have to have when you go into these uh, breakdowns. Not literal ISOP that you can get from uh, Rite Aid or Walgreens or your local pharmacy or your so-called doctor. This ISOP is speaking about the Holy Spirit. And to see is speaking about your mind being enlightened. So let me play this. Calorion. Calorion. Calorion, Irish right? Lexicon. Related entry. Okay. Calorion. Okay, all right, that's enough. Okay, it says, um, let's see. I had to descend the definition. Bear with me. A preparation composed of various materials and used as a remedy for tender eyelids. So a lot of brothers have tender eyelids. When your eyelids are tender, you can't really open them. A lot of brothers have spiritual tender eyelids. They can't really open up their mind to grasp what the most high is bringing out in the word. So you need that eye salve and it kind of opens up your eye a little bit and you can see the wonderful works of Yahweh, Yahweh Shah. On the carnal level, even on the spiritual level, the most high commands you to anoint your eye with eye salve. Pray that the most high gives you the Holy Spirit to be able to see what the scriptures are actually saying. Because some things are twofold, some things are threefold, some things are dark, parabolic. But you need your eyelids uh, open. You don't want tender eyelids in this thing. You know? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Right? Ephesians, the first chapter. I want to get these uh, quick precepts out. 
Salakia. Let's go to Ephesians, the first chapter. And I want verse 12, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go to Ephesians. It's like at 18. Yep, Ephesians chapter 1 and 18, right? It reads, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. So the most I has one level of eyes, you see, but you also have another level of eyes. The second level of eyes is the eyes of your understanding. That's the highest form of your eyes, meaning your mind. And your mind being enlightened, meaning full of wisdom and brightness and understanding. That can be really obtained through anointing eye salve that you can buy from the physician. So as we read the book of Job and read Genesis, let's have our eyes anointed with the eye salve that we may know what the, uh, the word of the Most High is going into. So we're breaking it down, right? Job 24 and 7. They cause the naked to lodge without clothing that they have no covering in the cold. And we don't have any covering in the cold right now. That's why we, and when somebody has no covering in the cold, they'll put on anything, like we always say. If you just fell into a freezing ocean, a freezing river, a freezing lake, and the water's below 20 degrees, and you got out, hey, guess what, man? Your body may go into shock. You may catch hypothermia, frostbite, you know? Do you really care what somebody puts on you to keep you warm? No. You're not trying to see if it matches. You're not trying to see if it's in style. Oh, this is from the year 2000. You're not, you're not thinking about that because you're so cold. All you're worried about is getting warm. You do not care what you put on. It doesn't matter at that point. You're at your wit's end. You're in the brink of death. You just need something. That's what our people do. That's why they're into Islam, Christianity, Catholicism, politics, drugs, madness, gangs, sold their soul because they're trying to put on anything. Because their spirit is naturally ashamed. They know, we know as a people that we're, we're missing something. So we just cleave into anything, right? Verse eight, they are wet with the showers of the mountains and embrace the rock for want of shelter. You see that? So this shows you how, how Esau lived, and we live like this now. Now we are doing it. We as a people are embracing the rock because we don't have a home. A shelter is a home. We don't have a, a, a homeland as a people, right? Now we know we do the land of Israel, but I'm speaking about people in general of so-called um, Negro and Indian descent, you know? They don't really know what's going on. They don't. So therefore, we embrace the rock. We embrace Americanism. We embrace being a patriot. We embrace nationalism. We embrace the so-called white man's agenda because we do not have a true home. So the point of the matter is Esau takes away our covering because Esau never liked the covering from the jump. That's why he offered it to the most high. When he brought those cane, I mean, brought the uh, um, fruit of the ground, he didn't have that coat of skin on. He was naked when he put this on. He came to the most high naked, and that's if you got ears to hear, and offered the fruit of the ground as an offering to the Lord. Now, when you sin, where in the law, in the book of Exodus, after this Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where in the law, when you go to hell off, can you just bring fruit? That shows you that the most that that Cain was off, and he ain't give a damn about trying to get right, man. Huh? Let's go to the book of Numbers, the 18th chapter. Cain went the hell off. It's time to make an atonement for your sin. He's supposed to bring the animal that we're about to read about. Cain said, The hell with that. I want to do what I want to do. To hell with who I'm supposed to serve, I would, he could get what he want to get, and it is what it is. So that's pretty much putting up your middle finger, for lack of better terms, to the most high. You know, there's another word I want to use, but I'd rather not. You know? And that's the spirit that Cain is in. Right? This is the book of um, Numbers, 
Right, it's like in Numbers chapter 18 and 17, if I'm not mistaken. All right, let's get this real quick. This is the book of Numbers chapter 18 and 17. But the firstling of a cow or the firstling of a sheep or the firstling of a goat, thou shalt not redeem. They are holy. Thou shalt sprinkle their blood upon the altar and shall burn their fat for an offering made by fire for a sweet savor to the Lord. So that's the law. It's supposed to offer up a cow or the firstling of a sheep and sprinkle that blood on the altar. That's the law. That's how you reconcile yourself back to the most high. These were strict instructions. Remember, the law has been here from the beginning. Just because you read something in the book of Deuteronomy, like the dietary law or certain things like that, that doesn't mean that that's the first time, you know, it's been given by the Mosai. Numbers 18 and 17 was given. Particular precepts were given. Right? But nevertheless, Cain knew that, but he said, hey, the hell with that. I'm going to offer what I want to offer. And the Mosai could take it how he want to take it. Right? So that's wicked, man. That's wicked. That's like eating on the Day of Atonement. That's like blaspheming the Lord when you want when it's time to pray. That's just saying the hell with it. That's like going back in the world. So Cain said, hey, look, yeah, I'm off. I know Adam told me that we sinned and we have to do this to get right with God. But I don't want to get right with the Lord. I'm going to do what I want to do. Here, take this. And it is what it is. That's why we always say Cain is one of the most wicked, top three wicked men. Maybe top top four, you know. Verse four, and Abel, Genesis four and four, he also brought up the first ling of his flock, which is read that in Numbers the eighteenth chapter, right? The first ling of your flock. Abel brought that, and of the fat thereof, we read that in Numbers chapter eighteen. Right, burn their fat for an offering made by fire. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Why did the Lord have respect unto Abel and his offering? Because Abel had the coat of skin on. Abel had his garment on. Abel was keeping the law. Abel knew the will of the Most High. That's what the Most High had respect unto Abel to his offering. Because he kept the commandment. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So imagine you know the difference between right and wrong. I'm going to show you where Cain's mind is at. How evil. Let's really analyze how evil this man is. And, and how just wretched and corrupt and ungodly and unjust a man can be. You know the difference between right and wrong, right? You know what's righteous, you know what's wicked. It's not as if Cain didn't know. Cain knew what he did was wicked. Yet, Cain still decided to be upset that the Most High didn't respect his offering. What type of man in their right mind knows the difference between right and wrong, does wrong, and get upset when somebody's not dealing with that? You know? And, and that, that's Esau's and more. Again, as we go through this, you see a lot of parallels between the behavior of Cain and Esau. Think about the so-called white man, huh? He'll, he'll rape, rob, and murder, bomb a city, destroy hospitals, sex traffic children, molest little boys, you try to correct them and he get mad and get violent. So that's what happened with Cain, man. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? I mean, he fix your face. What you mad for? Ain't no reason to look all wild, man, in the face. You went off and you know you went off. If thou doest well, Shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, 
and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shall rule over him. And this was the ultimatum that Cain had to deal with. If you do well, I and mean, if you do the offering right, I'll accept you. If you don't want to do that offering right, then sin lieth at the door. Meaning, if you decide from this day forward to continually be evil and wicked, you, you can leave. You serve no purpose in righteousness for me. Sin is at the door. You can go that way. Once you leave this truth and leave this, the, the laws of the Most High, Satan is out there. And he lieth at the door. He's waiting for you to leave. And he's trying to come in. He's trying to come into your mind. Right? So sin lying at the door is, is if you leave the house of the Lord, then you're going back into the world, into Satan. But also Satan lieth at the door, meaning your mind, and also trying to come in. Sin always lies at the door. That's why it tells you, right, let's get this real quick. Let me get this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right? I mean, it's like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right? Where the Most High said that he would deliver such a one to Satan. It's like you. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 5. I'm going to start at 4. And the name of our Lord, Yahweh Shahamashiach, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord, Yahweh Shahamashiach, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, Yahweh Shah. You see that? So the Most High is speaking in terms of kicking men out the church, excommunication, if you can understand. A man committed fornication. The Most High said, once that man is removed from the camp or from the congregation, it's like you're delivering him unto Satan. Because the church is where the spirits of righteousness dwell at. Outside the church is the world. Lust, sex, drunkards, madness, reverie. So if you deliver a man unto Satan, you remove him from the congregation. Right? Now, the Apostle Paul said... Right outside the, the, the church of Corinth is Satan. Once this man is out, he has no other ruler but the spiritual demon Satan. And that's what the most I told Cain. Hey, if you do, if you don't want to do uh well, send the life at the door. You can serve the spiritual demon Satan if you want to, man. You don't have to serve me. Let's go to Luke chapter 22 and 31. Let's get another precept on that. St. Luke chapter 22 and 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. So Satan is lying at the door. He's desiring to have you. What does that mean, have you? Destroy you, devour you, sift you out, take the Holy Spirit away from you. He desires you. So Cain has, I mean, the most high has people that he desires. And Satan has people that he desires. Satan desired Cain. That's the hell of a, of a relationship. And uh, Cain desired Satan. Let's go to the book of Revelation, the third chapter. Dealing with the door. Right? Dealing with the door. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So that's why you have this. Uh, if you've seen cartoons back in the day, they'll have uh, an angel on. Let me see if I can find this. One shoulder and a devil on the other. Right. You'll see this in cartoons. Growing up, I remember they had it, Tom and Jerry, other cartoons, the Flintstones. You know, you had this picture of i guess what scholars are calling the shoulder angel so you have an angel on your right i mean on, on one side and you have satan on the other side just what this means that i stand at the door a door serves two purposes right to enter and to exit now these demons they want to enter into you they want to come in through your mind Right through your door, through your spirit. Yahweh Shai, he's also on the outside. He wants to come in through your mind and through your spirit. 
and they're knocking at the door. Who are you going to answer to? Right? Sin lieth at the door, and Yahweh Shah standeth at the door. That's where they got that from. They didn't just make that up. This this, this from uh, what is that? Um, Emperor's New Groove, right? They didn't just make this up out of nowhere. They got this from the Bible, from the Holy Scriptures. And a lot of people, they send up there thinking about it. Do I want to serve sin or do I want to serve the Lord? So you have Yahweh Shai saying, look, I'm here. All you got to do is repent, allow me to come into you, and I'm going to build you up with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That's what Yahweh Shai is saying. All right, let's go to Song of Solomon, the fifth chapter. Let's get another precept on that. Write this Song of Solomon, chapter 5, and verse 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that does what? That knocketh, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So this is speaking about us being asleep, meaning in a dead estate, disconnected from the heritage. And what's that? That knock waking us up? It's the voice of the beloved, the prophets teaching on the highways and byways. And they're telling you, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Open up to me. Receive Deuteronomy 28. Receive this precept. Receive that precept. Receive that precept. Let me walk into your vessel, enter into your temple. And when the Lord come in, he's saturated with water. He's filled with dew, that moisture. To 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 uh, quicken your spirit, man. You know, so either you can open to the Lord, or you can open to sin, and that's a, a, a battle that we face every day. This is not just a a rebuke to Cain. Don't look at this and say, "Oh, Cain had Cain one had he had one hell of a situation he had to deal with." Right? You have one situation. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. Yes, you do, brother. This is presented to you every day. Do you want to sin or do you want to serve the most high? Do you want life or do you want death? How do you want it, man? You quit that nasty sight. You smoke that weed. You freak off. You, you fall off. You have chosen who you want to come inside you, man. You know? So let me read this one more time. This is what the Lord told Cain, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shall rule over him. Meaning you and sin and you and Satan will be two peas in a pod. And Cain had to dwell on this, mate. You know, he heard this and he had to make a decision. Like we all have to. We all have to make a decision and decide. You know, do we want to serve the Lord or not? Well, ultimately, we know it's predestination, but on the carnal level, once that's presented to us, which it is, we have to make a decision. If you're watching this live in sincerity and in truth, then you have made your decision to serve the most high. If you're doing God knows what on this Friday night in the world, then you have also made your decision. So Cain had to make a decision. Let's see what Cain chose. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now, there's no account of how he murdered Abel, but we know the M.O. of the so-called white man. Esau has to fight Jake through craftiness, biological warfare, subtlety, false speeches, deceit. That's the only way he could have he took down Abel. I'm led to believe, and I was not written in there, but I'm led to believe if it was an even plan field, you know, and an even opportunity, Cain wouldn't stand a chance. Proverbs, I believe that. Proverbs chapter 26 and 25. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. So when I, maybe Cain came up to him and said, hey, look, you know, I went off. I can't believe I was doing that. I was tripping. I, you know, how could I forget that I'm supposed to offer 
the first link of the flock and the fat thereof. I can't believe I messed up. Jeez, Abel, what do you think? And Abel, you know, Abel sent up there, well, you know, you should you got to get right because, you know, you don't want to mess up. The most high, he kill you. Cain probably said, yeah, yeah, you're right. And the most high probably said something under his breath. He said, hey, Abel, can you hand me that right there? Right? Abel goes to hand it. Like I said, this isn't written. This is just my mind. Cain picks up a, a rock or a weapon and kind of hit him upside the head and kills him. And cold blood. Cold blood. So Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And why did he kill him? Let's go to 1 John. It tells you. Why did he kill him? It wasn't for money. It wasn't to be seen of men. Why? That's the question. Did Cain kill Abel? Well, it's documented like everything else is. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 10. And this the children of the Most High are manifest. And the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of the Most High. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So it is only really at the end of the day two children. Either you in his truth, you're a child of the Most High. Or you serve in the spiritual demon Satan. Right? For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. And that's the law from the beginning. They were taught to love one another. Abel and Cain. Not as Cain who was of that wicked one. And slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil. And his brother's righteous. You see that? So Cain is of that wicked one. The wicked one is Satan. How do you know that? Let's go to the book of Matthew. The third chapter. The wicked one is Satan. So when the Lord says Cain is of that wicked one, he's essentially saying that Cain's father on a spiritual level is the spiritual demon Satan. Right? I had a precept I was getting. It's like in the book of Matthew. Right? The 13th chapter. Just to show that Cain, Cain is of that wicked one. Right, let's get a quick precept on that. Right, so like you bear with me. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 13. So like you bear with me. The Lord said, Then come at that wicked one. Okay. It's like it. Matthew 13 and 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh <clears throat> the wicked one and catcheth the way the work that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. And the wicked one is called Satan in Mark 4 and 14 on down. The sower soweth the word, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. And take it away the word that was sown in their heart. So in one precept in the book of Mark, Satan is called. It's like he goes by the wicked one. I mean, um, Satan. And then another account he goes by the wicked one. So those are just different titles or different names attributed to the spiritual demon Satan. The wicked one. So 1 John 3 says Cain is of that wicked one. Which means when you're of something, I mean, you come from it. So Cain came from essentially the spiritual demon Satan, because he decided to make Satan his dad. Satan uh, decided to adopt Cain and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him. So why did Cain slay Abel? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So to make that make sense, right? We understand what it means, but think about the what type of individual that would be to kill somebody because you're wicked and they're righteous. It's not over money. It's not an altercation. It's not over a woman. It's not over. It's, it's because you decided to kill your brother because you're wicked and they're righteous. Is that not the world we live in today? So Cain was off, man. You, you would think when brothers kill each other, at least come up with a, a reason. 
Not that any reason is valid, but Jake, they'll kill each other. Like I said, over, over a woman, drugs, you know what I'm saying? God knows what, man, shoes. Cain just killed Abel off the fact that Cain is wicked, that he's wicked and his brother's righteous. Let's go back to this in Genesis, the fourth chapter. Right? So now we know Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. Let's get uh, Luke. Let me get another quick precept on that. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 11. Right? Let's go to Luke, chapter 11. And again, Cain came back on the earth as Esau. We're going to cover that in time to come. St. Luke chapter 11 and 51. From the blood of Abel. I'm going to start at, uh, let's start at 49. Therefore also said the wisdom of the Most High. I will send them prophets and apostles. And some of them, they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. And the Lord is about the name of prophet. From the blood of Abel. So Abel's a prophet. Right? From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. And Zacharias was a prophet. Which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. See that? So the blood of Abel, Abel is a blood, a slakian. Abel is a prophet, right? Now, Cain killed Abel because our people are always being put to death or the prophets or the men of the Lord, the apostles, the sons of God are always being destroyed by Esau. I mean, I mean that happens all throughout the course of life of us as a people since we have existed we have always been dealing with the persecution of esau that goes back to genesis chapter 27 39 on down where esau said the days of mourning for my father at hand then when i slay my brother jacob right so this is why cain killed abel and murdered him in cold blood because of that old hatred genesis 4 and 9 and the lord said unto cain where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Meaning, am I responsible for my brother's life? Well, yes, you are responsible for your brother's life. We are a brother's keeper. The word keep means to watch, shamar in the Hebrew. Even sisters will say that to sisters or to their husband, Yahweh Shai Shamar Atha, right? Which means watch you or watch over you. Now, when you watch over somebody, it doesn't mean you just stare at them like a creep and look at them. You protect them. You prevent things or you watch over things that may harm them. That's what it means to be a watcher or a watchman for your brother. Cain said to hell with that being a watchman spirit. I don't want to watch after my brother. I want to watch after me. So he lied, man. He said, I don't know what this Negro is. Am I supposed to care about his life? Now, I don't say this, but I'm led to believe Cain was yelling at the Moshe. Rather, the Lord sent the angel or prophet out. Whoever the messenger was, I'm led to believe Cain was yelling at him. I don't think Cain said, I don't know. No. My, my brother's keep. No, I think, I think he, you know, Esau, he hate the Moshe so bad and righteousness. He, he, he led, I'm led to believe he kind of spazzed out. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? What does that translate to? I don't know this nigga, man. I don't care about his life. It ain't my problem. I don't care what the hell happened to him, man. It ain't, it ain't me. I'm about me. That's that proud spirit. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. See that? So the voice of the blood uh, of Abel's blood cries from the ground. Meaning what? When Abel went up there to the spirit world, Abel was actually telling the Most High what happened to him on the earth. That's what this means, that the voice of your brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. So Abel died and went up to the spirit world and was telling the Most High, hey, look, he murdered me. 
Hey, that guy, him right there. Are you going to do anything about it? Exact vengeance. Let's get that in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Because we have to understand that when the righteous died and they're murdered, they essentially go before the Most High and dispute what happened to them on earth. How the, how dealings may have fell out. Right? This Hebrews chapter 12 and 24. And to Yahweh Shai, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. You see that? So Yahweh Shai's blood speaks better things than Abel's blood. Because when Yahweh Shai went up to the spirit world, he's trying to bring forgiveness, grace, mercy, make intercession. That essentially is more superior than what Abel did. Not saying Abel went off, but Abel went up there to complain about injustice being wrought on the earth. Yahweh Shah is doing that amongst other things. So Yahweh Shah's blood speaks better things than that of Abel. So when Abel was murdered, he still spoke. Spiritually, if you got ears to hear. Right? He still testified what happened to him on the earth. And it happens. Any brother that's murdered unjustly, believe it or not, they actually go up to the most high and complain. If they died in their righteousness. If you died out uh, in your wickedness, then yeah, that was a judgment. You know? So let's go back to Genesis chapter 4 and 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And that shows you that Esau, he, you know, he's cursed from the earth. He doesn't have what Jake has. Right? It's lucky. Yeah. He doesn't have what Jake has, man. Jake got a green thumb. We got men that, you know, even they say when George Washington Carver was on the earth, the botanist, he can actually talk to plants. Esau has to have GMO, pesticides, toxins, Monsanto, all that just to bring forth fruit. So Esau is cursed from the earth. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Right? So the Most High cursed him and told him, look, the earth is going to be against you. You're going to be a fugitive. What is a fugitive? It's not a fugitive somebody running away from the law. Don't they have bounty hunters? Crime scene task squads? SWAT teams to catch these fugitives. You may have murdered somebody in, in California and you're on the on the way to Oregon. And you're a fugitive, man. You may have broken out of prison, you know, before your sentencing or, or whatever the case may be. You would be a fugitive. Cain is a fugitive on the earth, which means Cain is running away from justice. Right? Cain is running away from law. Not only is that uh, is that the case, he's also a vagabond. A vagabond is somebody, let's pull this up. They have no certain dwelling place. Pull this up. A vagabond. Vagabonds don't have a permanent home. A person who wanders from place to place without a home or a job. Because really Esau right now, he's an, he's an American He's a South African. He's a, a European. He's a Hawaiian now. He doesn't have a certain dwelling place. He's a vagabond. Now, the Mosai did give him a land. What land did the Mosai give Cain or Esau? He gave him Mount Seir. He didn't give him the uh, Caucasus Mountains. He didn't give him uh, uh, America. There was a land mass given to this people, and it's Mount Seir. But Esau said, to hell with that. I want to take over everybody's land. So he's a vagabond. He has military bases all throughout the world. You can pull it up. He has United States embassies all throughout the world. You can look it up. He's always wandering from land to land, looking whom he may destroy and devour. Now, I, I tell you this. If you, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I don't work for the police department. But there has to be a crime for harboring fugitives. 
Because that's what Jake do when they coon. I'm going to see if I'm spelling this right. So, Lockie, bear with me. Harboring a fugitive. You see that? A person who violates this section is guilty of a misdemeanor and the conviction is subject to imprisonment not exceeding one year of fine or a thousand years. See that? That's a felony. They say up to three years. So a lot of people who cleave to the so-called white man and accept him, like this Eve at camp earlier, they are harboring a fugitive. We don't bring these eat up, and, and then again, that's that's off, man. Because this man murdered your brother, and you're still gonna hide him, right? Still not gonna put him out there on the forefront. He's a fugitive on the earth, and Esau's a hypocrite because if you get caught holding on to a fugitive, what do you think happened to you? You're doing big time. They're gonna throw you under the jail, Negro. But you, if you hold on to a fugitive, Esau, you want to cleave unto him, and he accepts that, huh? Bring him to dinner with you. You know? Sit him down and feed him peas and carrots. You're holding on to a fugitive. Not just any fugitive, somebody that's running away from killing your brother. That's part of his curses. And the Lord said unto Slaki, and listen to this damn devil. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Right? Why is this wrong? Because the Most High told him that you killed your brother. You know it. This is wrong because Cain is not remorseful. Cain doesn't have a contrite heart. He's not even going to apologize. Not even a Slaki. He's not even going to sit there and say, look, man, you know, my, I got the best of me, my anger. You know, I should have controlled myself. I think that maybe I'll do this better than that. He couldn't even do that. The first thing he went to do was cop a plea. And that's what Esau do, man. That's why they get all these hung trials, acquittals. They plead insanity. Anything to get away from their true punishment. They'll cry in the courtroom like Kyle Rittenhouse. My punishment is greater than I can bear. No remorse. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So when he's removed from the face of the earth, it's not talking about he leaves planet Earth and goes to planet X. Right? That's not what it's talking about. When it says, from thy face shall I be hid, it doesn't mean a, a Cain has a secret location where the Mosai can't find them. Like, that's his blind spot. Like, when you drive, you got a blind spot. There's no blind spot for the Lord. When it says, from thy face shall I be hid, it's speaking about the Mosai. He is no longer going to be dealing with you in terms of him of being your father, you being his son. He's not going to teach you. He's not going to build you up. He's not going to give you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Because the most high has hid his face from us. And we know exactly how that feels. Let's go to Hosea chapter 5. Well, let's go to Hosea chapter 5. And that's really another reason why Esau, a lot of his doctrine is, is shaky. Because he's not dealing with the doctrine of the most high. He's dealing with Satan. Right? Hosea chapter 5 and 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face and their affliction, they will seek me early. So the Most High said he's going to hide his face from us. Same thing he told Cain. From my face shall I be hid. Now let's think about it. What happened to us when the Most High hid his face from us? Slavery, castration, rape, robbery, murder, Buck breaking, extortion, lies, plundering, pillaging. These are the things that happen when the Lord hid his face from us. What do you think is, is Cain on? That means the most I's not going to be dealing with Cain on that level. There was a time, key word was, but from this point forward, our communication, our relationship, me giving you things that you need, you're going to have to get it from somewhere else. You're going to have to get it from Satan because I'm not going to give it to you. 
There's even a prayer in the book of Numbers, the sixth chapter, regarding that. Right? Let's pull that up real quick. Okay, this is Numbers chapter six and twenty four. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, meaning the Most High gives you more light, more wisdom, more brightness, more understanding. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. You see that? So the point is the Most High will make his face shine upon you, or the Most High can hide himself from you. Verse 15. And, and also there's a point I want on this. It says, this is what Cain said, uh, it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Still no remorse, still no repentance. Now for the Christians. Who's everyone here? Because in Christianity, they say that Adam and his wife are the only people. Well, if Adam and his wife are there and Cain is there, Abel is dead, who's everyone that finds him is going to kill him? He was concerned about something called the law of the avenger, where it shows that, that the nearest of kin can avenge the murder of their brother or their relative. And they can just take that appropriate action unless this man is in a city of refuge. If that's the case, he has to hide to the death of the high priest, etc. Right, but the point of the matter is, Cain knew that there were more people on earth. This goes back to the law. Let's get that real quick. Let's get the law about the revenging of blood. Well, let's go to Numbers chapter 35. Right, Numbers chapter 35. And really, I'm not going to read this whole chapter, but. Numbers 35 and 11. Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person that unaware. So that's manslaughter. If you get caught um, today, a vehicular manslaughter, or you get caught for particular things, that's, that's something different than actual outright murder. You might kill somebody unaware. I mean, it's not premeditated. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So the avenger was a brother, a, you know, a father, an uncle, a son, a nephew that could step up and kill the guy that killed their relative. See that? Verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment. It's like I read that already. Genesis 4, 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the Most High said, look, I want to kill this man. I don't want nobody to kill him but me. If you get to him before I get to him, I'm going to pay you back sevenfold. The Most High said, look, I don't want even anybody to mistake this guy for anybody. I'm going to set a mark upon him. That mark goes into the most high taking away his melanin. Now, Cain originally looked like, you know, me and you. If you, you know, look like me, of course, or look like a brother, any brother in the truth. But Cain lost his melanin and it was stripped away. And as his melanin was stripped away, it was a clear indicator that, hey, this guy ain't right. Even today, when you look at all of the nations, a lot of the nations are originally dark. You know, or they have some form of melanin, even if they're not dark, dark. But Esau's the only nation who sticks out. So, you know, he's already telling on himself. He's the only people that's red like the devil who just sticks out. And that goes back to that mark that the Lord gave Cain. Now, Cain, well, I'm going to read on. And this sevenfold, when you go to Psalms chapter 79, you can see David actually praying that. Praying that the most time would kill Cain and these Edomites, these devils, sevenfold. Psalm 79 and 11. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, 
preserve thou those that are appointed to die, and rent them to our neighbors, look at this, sevenfold into their bosom. Their reproach were with they have reproached thee, O Lord. So the Lord wants to get them back sevenfold. You can't get Esau now. The Lord is going to get up with them. That's what the Mosai said. Even for the same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Right? Romans 9 and 17. But the scripture said unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So the most High wants Cain to get away with it, get away with it, get away with it, build kingdoms, build America, build these different systems, and be the greatest man ever. Because once you're the greatest man and I come destroy you, I'm going to be the new greatest man. And people are going to ask, who took down the previous great man? They're going to say, it's Yahweh, Bashmi, I was shy. They're going to say, who? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the most High essentially reserved this man for him. Verse 16, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife as she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Now you have an Enoch on the right hand side. You have an Enoch on the left hand side. Kanawak, which means dedicated or enlightened one. So Cain, uh, much to our you know, lack of uh, amazement and surprise, he actually named his son after him and named the city after him. You see that? And why would Cain name his son Enoch? What is he dedicating him to? What is he enlightening him with? Because that's what the name means. Well, he's dedicating him to the spiritual demon Satan and he's enlightening him with knowledge of the of evil. And that's a point I want to touch on, too. When we went back to Genesis, the fourth chapter, let me touch on that, because I kind of went over that. That's the spirit. Okay, back here in Genesis 4 and 7, when it says, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. And Cain decided to take it. Well, ultimately, Cain went to the east of Eden. And what was at the east of Eden? Cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So when it was time to exile man out of the garden, the most I put on the east, key directional ordinance, on the east of Eden, cherubims and the flaming sword to stop man from accessing the tree of life. On the east of Eden, that's what happened, where Satan was set up to block man's mind from finding immortality. Cain decided to go to the east of Eden. Why go to the east of Eden? Because that's where his dad is. Satan. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built the city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Iran begot Mahujael. And Mahujael begot Methusael. And Methusael begot Lamech. And Lamech took it to him two wives. The name of the one was Adah. And the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah bear Jabal, he was the father of all such as dwell in tents and as such as have cattle. So, you know, we brought this up before. When you see Genesis and you read about Jabal, Tubal, Cain, and these different men who are wise men on the left hand side, how did they get their wisdom? How did Cain know how to build the city? How did these men know? about handling the harp and the organ, the cattle, training and building up the animals. Esau, or Cain essentially at that time, received that knowledge from Satan. Satan can give you wisdom, even on the left-hand side. How do you know that? Let's get that. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 19. Right, let's go to Sirach chapter 19 and 22. Quick precept on that. Right, please ask us chapter 19 and 22. The knowledge of wickedness is not wisdom, neither at any time the counsel of sin is prudence. So you have something called the knowledge of wickedness, which isn't profitable. 
but it still exists. This is what the knowledge that Cain had. He had the knowledge of wickedness. And that's how these men were able to pass that knowledge on to their sons and show them particular things, how to manipulate the elements and get away with murder and have tents and build cities. It takes a strong, intelligent person to build a city. Cain used that opportunity to deal with Satan and actually get that wisdom, right? Remember, Cain dwelt and went to the east of Eden on the land of Nod. What did the Most High put on the east of Eden? Let me get that real quick. Genesis, the third chapter. Let me prove that. Right? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. See that? So what's at the east of the Garden of Eden? Cherubims and a flaming sword. Really a hip talk for Satan. This is why Cain went to the east of Eden. He didn't just trip and fall. Cain deliberately went to the east of Eden to get that wisdom from Satan. Even Satan told you, I was shot. Thou come, to, if thou bow down and worship me. All should be done. So Satan can give you things, man. And the most I can give you things on the right hand side. But when you work with the left hand side, you get it quicker. You know, but it also requires sacrifice too. Let's read on. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled a harp and an organ. And Zila, she also bare Tubal king, an instructor of every artificer of brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal king was not Amma. So Tubal king had that been making weapons. He was an instructor, a teacher, to every man that dealt with brass and iron. So you know he was making elements. I mean, it's like you're making uh, uh, swords and daggers and knives and arrows. Now the word Tubal Cain, it means weapon maker or mercenary. Right? Let's pull this up. See if they actually get that. Thou will be brought of Cain. That's not what it's going into. Okay, let's see. You see that? Tubal Cain, Smith of Scoria. Scoria of metal. Tubal Cain. Inventor of working in iron. So Tubal Cain was a smith. A smith is like a blacksmith, a silversmith. They make weapons. A blacksmith makes weapons. Tubal Cain was a smith. He made weapons. That's how you instruct people to use iron and brass out of the earth. You see that? So he makes all of the iron weapons. And they used them. Now, I don't say this, but they may, I'll put that word, they may have used them to destroy and kill and rape, rob, and murder. You know? And Lamech said unto his wives, Adat and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of, of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain should be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. Slacky, bear with me. So, Lamech is one of the sons or descendants of Cain. Now, look at the parallel between how he handled the situation and how Esau gets away with murder. He said, I have slain the man to my wounding, not to that family's wounding, not to that brother's wife's wounding, not to his children's wounding. I killed the man. I feel bad about it. Do we believe that? Do we believe that the sons of the wicked, when they murder and kill, that they feel bad about it? No. Which means when Lamech killed this man, he did it intentionally. Now you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. He don't say intentionally. But, you know, you have to extrapolate in the Bible. The word extrapolate means you have to read behind the scenes. Read between the lines. Let me see if I can spell this right. Extrapolate. <clears throat> Okay, extrapolate. Look at this. Extend the application 
to an unknown situation by assuming that existing trends will continue. What's the existing trend that continues? Well, Esau murders and never feels bad about it. We look at that and see what Lamech said. He said, hearkening to my speech, but I have slain the man to my wounding and the young man to my hurt. You see that? So he killed two people, right? A man to his wounding and a young man to his hurt. So he was just murdering people and lying about it. So Lamech was off. Now Lamech and the, now there's a Lamech, which is the earthly father of Noah. And there is a Lamech on the left-hand side. This is the Lamech on the left-hand side. Lamech in the Hebrew means powerful, which means that this man had to have been off on the left-hand side on a high level. If Cain should be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech 70 and sevenfold, which means basically I get away with murder. I can get away with murder because I come from Cain. Not only that, I'm going to make up my own prophecy and in a word and say, well, look, the most I said this about Cain, it's about me too. So Lamech had to have been extremely wicked as well. I mean, just ungodly. How do you kill somebody, justify it, and then say that you're going to be protected and nothing bad can happen to you? And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed of Abel, which whom Cain slew. Right? And to Cain, to him also, there was born a son. And, called his, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So men began to, to get in the spirit, do sacrifices, pray. The sons of God are being established. That's what that means. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Right? Now, there's another point I want to touch on. Salaki, yeah. Oh, how it says, um, Salaki, Genesis 4 and 20. Esau being a father of such as have tents and dwell in cattle, he or Cain, rather, he's the father of them that handle the harp and the organ. Tubal Cain, he's the father of the artificer and brass. That's Esau spirit now, because Esau now he's the founding father of medicine. Let's see, father of medicine. Let's see mechanics. Sir Isaac Newton, father of painting. Esau always wants to be the father of something, the beginning. William Frederick Eames. Let's see. So the point of the matter is that Esau is always the father of these different things. He's the father of medicine. Hippocrates. And we know what that's going into. These uh, doctors have to take a Hippocratical oath. And Hippocrates actually served Greek gods. So when you take a Hippocratical oath, Believe it or not, with Hippocratical Oath, you are swearing your allegiance to Ausclepius and other Greek gods. You know, a lot of them doctors, that's why they into witchcraft and sorcery, because they're following Hippocrates, who's the father of medicine. Same thing in Genesis 4. He's the father of this. He's the father of that. He's the father of this. He started this. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, it's lucky I read that, verse 26. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son. And he called his name Enos, then began men to call upon the name of Yahweh. Right? So with that, I'm going to close up. I'm winding down. I'm giving, of course, all honor and glory to Yahweh by Shema Mashiach, Komalak Yahushai. Most I will you are edified. Uh, subscribe to the uh, Cold Cuts Resurrected channel. The main channel was suspended, but it's back up and running now. Another announcement, we're going to be doing a, a, the Sabbath service, the Shabbat service tomorrow, Lord willing, around 1230. So tune in to the Watchman for Israel channel and we'll do that live. We may have a live camp later. We'll see. But again, it's the Sabbath. Keep it holy. No buying, no selling, no doing your own pleasure, no speaking your own words, no lewdness and profanation, 
keep this Sabbath holy for brothers that are keeping it. But again, with that, most high willing, you were edified. It'll be another live tomorrow, Lord willing. Tomorrow morning, another live. So stay in tune, Lord willing, Lord willing, around 9 o'clock a.m. or so, depending on the spirit, right? Anywhere between 8.30 to 9. So stay in tune. Kwame Ashala, Shalom.